start, I've just had a series of domestic malfunctions which have held things up slightly. Uh, yes, that's right, it is the Joyrider TV Q&A session. This is being recorded live on Wednesday afternoon or sometime on Wednesday, depending on where you are in the world. If um, you are watching this later on, do be aware that I won't be able to respond to your questions immediately, but I'll respond to them in the typey typey comments section rather than actually being able to talk to you unless you happen to be here now. And I believe we're already off the mark with some hellos. We've got, it's pretty bright here today, to be honest. Um, we've got Brian in Ontario, Canada. And there's 10 degrees of ice and 10 weeks between me and the next sale. Oh my goodness. Wrap up warm. We've got Hutchie in Northumberland, UK. Lots of snow and ice. How cold can you sail? Not this cold at my age. Yeah, I don't blame you. Um, and then we've got Max in Rossenheim, Germany. Not too cold to sail. The lake is still free of ice. Max is certainly determined. Uh, we've got Mats in Sweden. Good day. I think it's Mats in Sweden. We've got Oscar. Have you already found have you already round some out because of my kite? No, um, I had a good poke about on the internet, but I think I did respond to you in one of the comments about what uh, Oscar's asking, how long should a bowsprit spinnaker pole be on a Hobie 16? And um, I haven't got that information off the top of my head, but... Um, but um, I'm pretty sure I did say what I'd found, but I just did a Google search for uh, Hobie 16 spinnaker pole length. And because uh, I haven't got one here, unfortunately. So uh, I can't help you directly by going and measuring one. Got Steve in Ontario, Canada. Yeah, so that's Matt who's got the FX1. I think that FX1 might have been called uh, one of the best FX ones we've ever seen on Show Us Your Cat. So nice to have Matt's on board. We've got Pierre in Quebec, Canada, minus, does that say minus 24? Oh my goodness. It's a lovely day here in sunny Vasiliki. It is as sunny as you think. We've got Kurosh in foggy Dubai, 25 degrees. We've got Nico in South Africa. Good to have you on board. How's it? Um, uh, it was the length of the shoot for the 20. Yeah, so I think in the response I sent regarding the length of the shoot, because we don't have any F20 catamarans, which would be about the same length as the, I think that's a Hobie 20 you're talking about. Um, I think the length of a tornado shoot would be too long, whereas the length of an F-18 shoot would be too short. But yes, I will measure those bad boys and uh, then you'll be able to have a rough starting point, which I'm pretty sure will be handy. Uh -huh, and we have Chris, who has finally made the live one. The shoot, thanks. All right. So Brett, we've got Brett on board in Maine, USA, minus 20, fresh water, it's very hard this time of year, although the ocean is liquid, about zero degrees, waiting for some warmer weather. After, ah, oh, Matt reckons he's been sailing like a grandpa. I say no, everybody is sailing in their own style, uh, which is very important. Um, yeah, so, the q and I have got some pre-loaded questions if the questions aren't coming in thick and fast, which I will, of course, get around to. And um, what I'll do after the video is uploaded, like I've done for the last two weeks, is I'll index, uh, time index when all the different questions get answered. So if you are watching this later, you could just refer to that to see what is interesting for you. 
And uh, of course, don't forget to hit the like button. Very important um, for the algorithm. All right, what we got? Matt says, that film gives me surely inspiration to let her loose rather than topping out 15 or 16 knots. Yeah, it's, um, uh, Matt's is referring to the time when I went out sailing on the FX1 in a tremendous amount of wind. Uh, that one was featured in the video recently, which was the top speeds that I hit of 2020, but it's definitely the fastest I've been on an FX1 and definitely the most wind that I've gone out sailing on one. And it was really a, a big tip here was dagger boards up on the reach, uh, about just over a foot maybe of dagger board out the top of the hull. And that means you can push the boat a lot further. With all the boats with dagger boards, if you're sailing fast on a reach um, and you've got your dagger boards down all the way, if you think about the tip of the dagger board and there'll be some pressure pushing back against the tip. Um, that pressure pushing back against the tip is going to be forcing the bows down, making the boat feel like it wants to pitch pole more. Another thing having too much dagger board down is going to do when you're sailing really fast on a reach is the, the flow of water coming round the dagger board might still be a bit turbulent by the time it gets to the rudder which means you're more likely to have some sort of steering problems, but that turbulent water is gonna slow you down as well. So for the high speeds, get the dagger boards up about a foot above the deck on an FX1 and she'll be, she'll be very grateful for that. There we go. At this time, just a cheap plug. Um, if you haven't been there recently, uh, the online store totaljoyrider.com has had a bit of a facelift and um, everything that was there is now gone and it's been replaced with some new styles. Yes, I've been uh, graphic designing a bit uh, in the past week, so worth a look there. And uh, now using a new supplier as well. So the stuff from there is no longer being shipped from the UK. This is because of Brexit and that everybody outside the UK was getting um, punished with VAT. So everything's coming from outside the UK now. Kurosh says, in general, do you go faster when flying the hull or sailing flat? If flying the hull is faster, does it matter at what angle? Yes, it does. Um, what we're looking for with the angle of which you are flying the hull is we're trying to reduce friction by getting the windward hull out of the water. But if we go, so uh, just to come to the conclusion before we go for the explanation, uh, the conclusion is what we're looking to do is to have the windward hull just clear of the water, which means occasionally, you may have heard this term before, the bottom of the hull just kissing the top of the waves. Um, that means that we've got the reduced friction, but without the boat uh, being at a crazy angle. If you go above that height, what will happen is the boat will start slipping sideways more because whatever's under the boat, whether you've got the hard edge of a 16, uh, a skeg hull or a dagger board, It'll work something like this, where that is stopping, this part is stopping the boat from going sideways. As we fly the hull, we can see what will happen. That will just, let's try and get this lined up. Yeah, lovely. Um, but it will just slip sideways. And then also the rig, when the rig is the most upright, that is when it's most efficient. If you look at how the um, slalom windsurfers were back in the day, or even now, they almost have the rig to windward slightly. Um, and like on, um, what was the boat called? Sail Rocket, I think. Um, the, wind, the rig on that was actually to windward, which has been proven to be the quickest way to have the rig slightly into the wind. So 
as you fly the hull, as the rig goes more to leeward, it's not going to produce the same amount of juice. So uh, that is why we're just having the hull clear of the water. There we go. Thanks for the question. Hi, Matthew. Great to have you on board. Okay, so I think we'll fire away with uh, our first preloaded question, which is from Scott in Oregon, USA. And you may have uh, or may not be aware that there is a Hobie 16 World Championships scheduled for, I believe it's in September this year in Spain. And Squat, <laughs> Scott is asking, um, how do you qualify for the Worlds? Well, as far as what generally happens at a Hobie 16 Worlds is the entries would be limited to 120 boats. Um, some of those boats would be pre-qualified. Uh, they get pre-qualified by either being um, the world, a previous world champion, perhaps the European champion, perhaps um, maybe a regional champion in the US or somewhere that has that kind of ranking. Maybe you're a national champion, but if you've done well at previous events, there is a strong chance that you'll be pre-qualified uh, for the world championships. If you're not pre-qualified, then what there generally is at the Worlds is what's called a pre-qualification, or sorry, a qualification series, which would be before the main event, where everybody else is fighting it out um, to get... Um, but then if you don't qualify, it doesn't mean then you have to pack your bag and go. Um, if you don't qualify, what happens is the fleet gets split... Um, there's usually something called a split party, which in days of old used to involve quite a lot of beer. Um, but um, the fleet will be split and there'll be gold fleet. Gold fleet is the fleet that you often see with the matching sails, which are supplied by the manufacturer. And then there'll be silver fleet for everybody who didn't qualify for gold fleet. Um, the, the competition in silver fleet to be honest, at the front end of the fleet can be almost as hard as at the front end of gold fleet. So there's no shame in um, racing in silver fleet. It's still pretty fierce. But as you drop that back down the numbers, like into the 40s and 50s in silver fleet, then it will be slightly less fierce, let's say. But um, that is the general vibe with the qualification for a 16 Worlds. Um, and then generally for all of the boats that are coming from outside of that country, or I think because this one's in Europe, it would probably be for the boats, for the sailors who are coming from outside Europe, there'll be charter boats available as well. So you can just fly in, get, pick up your charter boat, which will be brand new. Oh, yes. And then off you go. Happy days are here again. Um that is as far as I know. Um, I'll get in touch with Rich from the association and find out exactly what the vibe is. There isn't a notice of race up yet for the 16 Worlds this year. Uh, it would usually be on the notice of race where all of this good information is um, conveyed. Can we say that? Okay. All right. We've got a second question from Scott, and this is one uh, more to do with uh, the actual sailing of the boat. He asks, when is sailing straight downwind optimal rather than jibing? So um, I have got, I've, 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 I've brought out the, uh, the classroom. Okay, so in a classroom situation, the wind always blows from the top. All right, let's just, which way does that need to go? All right, so normally on a catamaran, when we sail downwind, we'd sail a series of jibes. This is a boat with two sails, like a Hobie 16, Prindle 16, um, kind of vibe, Dart 18. We'd sail in a series of jibes 
pretty much doing the opposite angles to what we were doing upwind. So about 90 degrees, sorry, 45 degrees to the, the true wind, which is when we'd see our bridle wires at the front. How am I, um, here's the bridle wires at the front of the boat. The wind indicators on the bridle wires would be showing 90 degrees apparent wind. And that 90 degrees apparent wind is what is gonna give us these angles, which is generally the way to do it on a downwind point of sail. What Scott is asking is when is it better just to go, if you're going from here, just have to make sure this doesn't go off the screen. Uh, if you're going from here to here, Sailing straight line does seem like a very good idea, but the, uh, we've talked about VMG the last possible, uh, the last um, couple of weeks, velocity made good, for what is the optimal angle between going straight to the buoy and sailing fast. The reason we don't generally sail straight downwind is because it's extremely slow. The reason a catamaran is fast is if here's our sail is, well, one of the reasons is because we get an even flow of air over both sides of the sail. Then if we sail straight downwind, we're not gonna get that even flow of air. What we're gonna get is what you'd get on a traditional boat or a tall ship or something. If that's our sail, the wind's gonna come in and then it's gonna be like this on the inside and then there'll be nothing going on in this area. So it's a more of a turbulent airflow rather than in the previous example, a laminar airflow, which is much more efficient. And um, the boat is benefiting from having that fully battened sail. But the time when it is more efficient just to sail straight downwind, I would say is in wind less than, I don't know, five knots perhaps, maybe less than that. Um, because you can get the boat in really light winds, really tickling along nicely. All right, we, we're gonna just have a, a quick look at the boat. And the way you get the boat sailing really fast, straight downwind, is by getting really far forwards. So you get your crew weight really far forwards. Whether you're single-handed or sailing with a crew, if um, the best, in my experience, the best place to be is to be sat on the hull here. I know, that's far forwards. Um, using the beam as a backrest, and then you have to kind of reach back for the tiller extension, but in those light winds, you shouldn't have to be quite as on the ball with the steering because you are going to be going pretty slowly. Um, so by getting really far forwards, what that does is it brings the rig forwards, which will present more sail area to the wind. And it will also lift the back of the boat out of the water, meaning your rudders, we're talking just the tip is in the water there with the rudders by getting really far forward. So that's less drag. So it's a really efficient way of sailing in the super light wind. If you are going to sail straight downwind like that, you do need to let the sails out as far as they would go. Um, almost to the extent, no word of an exaggeration, that... You could, if you're sailing with a snap shackle on the main sheet, you could just undo the main sheet, let the boom go all the way out to the shroud, and um, then the wind in the sail will just keep the boat, uh, keep the sail all the way out, and um, you'd be, you'll be uh, showing as much sail area as possible to the wind when sailing very deep downwind. All right. 
Hi, Stephen. Great to have you on board. Hello, Richard. Good to have you on board as well. So I hope, hope that explains when it would be good to sail straight downwind. Another time might be if there's a load of traffic, um, again, in the really light winds, if there's a load of traffic like other boats, if you're in a race, all the other boats are going for the angles. Um, and if you follow them, the boats behind you are going to give you dirty wind as well. Then, and perhaps you're a little way back in the fleet. Have you got anything to lose by trying something different? You've probably only got something to gain. Whereas by following everyone, uh, perhaps um, you've only got to lose. Hmm. Okay, so there we are. All right. So, have we got any other questions come in just yet? Not yet. All right, so sticking with the preloaded questions at the moment, uh, we've got a question from Chris, who I believe is watching live at the moment. Um, he says, if the, this is, a, we're talking juicy now, um, if the bows are driving down, we're talking strong wind, and a pitch pole is imminent, is there anything you can do to either stop the pitch pole or lessen the severity? Okay, um, there's a few things going on here. The, um, if we're sailing, let's say we're sailing on a broad reach, so... Um, on this downwind angle we've just been talking about, and we fit, we can, um, we feel a gust hit us. If we do nothing in that gust, if it's windy, there is a chance the bows are just going to go in. And once the rudders are out, there's not a great deal that you can do, other than um, a very popular one. All right, I'm just going to demonstrate. Is um, can you still see me? is to put your arm around the back of the beam like that so that as the boat sticks the nose in, you're not getting thrown forward on the boat and you're anchored to the back of the boat by putting your arm around the back beam. Very good idea. But the ideal thing to do is if you're sailing on a broad reach, when you feel that gust just first hit is then to start taking the boat further downwind. So that extra pressure gets transformed into more boat speed and a better angle downwind. And that is how you're gonna avoid the pitch pole there. Um, another thing that's good if it is windy, especially if you're sailing with two people on the boat, is the crew can be on gust watch. So looking, it would be if you're, um, which way would you be looking? You'd be looking pretty much square to the boat because you're going forwards. So the gusts from behind, let's illustrate this. Um, so where to look for the gusts on the downwind leg if it's windy. All right, let's have, let's have a look, shall we? So if we're sailing like this, All right, and we're whipping along nicely. And of course, the wind is coming from up here. When we're going along, the gusts that we're going to be getting hit by are less likely to be what's going on up here, but instead, more what's going on here. Because as we go forwards, this gust is gonna be the first one to get us. So keep an eye out for those gusts and if you can see a really big one coming, perhaps bear away a little bit before it hits you so that you've already taken the sting out of it a little bit. But, um, okay, if you're um, double trapezing, let's say, so this is, that was how to avoid the pitch pole in the first place. If you're sailing downwind and you get hit by an absolute monster gust, very sharp, that kind of comes out of nowhere. And you feel that if you tried to turn the boat downwind, you would definitely stack it in a very impressive uh, way. 
if that is the case, then this is the only time when it would be appropriate in um, efficiency to turn the boat up into the wind rather than further downwind. This is if you're on a broad reach. Ram shots, um, so sailing downwind. Um, by jabbing the boat upwind a little bit, what that can do is transfer the force, which is driving the bows down, into more of a hull lifting force. But because on the downwind point of sail, you should already have your traveller out a long way and the main sheet out a bit as well. When you come up uh, onto more of a beam reach, there shouldn't be so much force that you would actually capsize sideways. You're also able, of course, to let the uh, mainsail out as well and the jib if you've got a crew who's uh, on the sheet. Um, and that can also be a pitch pole prevention method. If you're say if um, so, those are the prevention methods. If you're on a broad reach, um, if you're on a beam reach, so if you're double trapezing or single trapezing or just on a beam reach, and you get the feeling that the bows are going down, best thing to do there is loosen the sails. Um, if you've got a crew who's good on the sheet, um, they they want to be pre uh, pre instructed. If the bows start going down, just loosen the jib a little bit and that would take a lot of pressure off the nose of the boat. But let the main sheet out as well so you're playing the sails to stop the bows from digging in. Of course, you can move back further on the boat if you're not already right at the back of the boat. But um, in sort of more of a direct answer to Chris's question there, if you're already, if you know that it's going, the best thing you can do, you, if it's going, it's going. Especially on a 16, once the bows have gone under, because of the shape of the hulls, generally, if the bows have gone under, it's going in, if you're on a broad reach or a beam reach. So best thing to do is just to try to make sure if you're sat on the boat, that you're not going to go flying forward as well because there's all sorts of things that you could go flying into, such as the mast, uh, the fittings on the front beam, maybe the bridle wires, forestay, all that lot. So much better, just like I said, to start with, get your arm around the back beam, hold on to something solid, and just so that as it goes, you're not getting thrown forwards. And then what would generally happen, the bows would go in, and then the boat would flop onto its side, and then you could sort of step down onto the boom and uh, think about what just happened. Um, yeah, I think uh, the other time when you might put pitch pole, you might actually be on the trapeze. If you are double trapezing and it is like a pitch pole is imminent, if you're, well, let's backpedal a little bit. If you're sailing in a very strong wind on a reach or a broad reach, on the trapeze, first, most importantly, make sure you haven't got any of the ropes wrapped around your hand, caught around your feet, anything like that. Because if you get thrown forwards and that's the case, you could suffer an injury. Nobody wants that. So making sure that's not the case, if you do dig the bows in hard and you're double trapezing and you feel that, uh, that force just sending you to the front, best thing to do is just to boost a little bit away from the side of the boat. Just a little bend of the knees, just like kind of like abseiling kind of thing, where you just push away from the side of the boat a little bit. And then what that will do is mean that you'll be swinging clear of everything on the boat and you're not going to hit anything. So that is very important um, that you are getting flung uh, clear of everything, which you can do by just boosting away from the boat a little bit. Best thing. Um, and most fun as well. Um, and then when you get into the water, you should still have the trapeze with you. You might be a fair distance away from the boat. So that trapeze wire is kind of your route back to the boat. So by all means, unhook reasonably quickly, but don't let go of the wire. Use that to reel yourself back in 
so that you don't have a hectic swim back to the boat because nobody likes a hectic swim. Not the best times. There we go. I think that's about the size of it. But um, yeah, the let the, mate, let the sails out or turn more downwind. If you're on a beam reach, let the sails out. If you're on a broad reach, turn more downwind. But as you turn downwind, let the sails out a bit as well. And that just takes the pressure off the bow a little bit. Okay, I'm just gonna... Um, all right, we've got uh, Richard with a question. You may have covered this in the past. Do you have a winter maintenance checklist you follow for your boats? You'd think that we should, wouldn't you? Um, but no, uh, we haven't. But because we take the boats apart entirely, it gives us a very good opportunity to firstly check everything. Um, it's more checking the maintenance, I'd say. Um, so we check everything as it's getting taken off the boat. So perhaps we would, last time the sails come down, we check the sails for anything that needs to be repaired or if um, we're gonna look at replacing the sails. One place which is definitely worth checking on your sails is the bolt rope, uh, which goes up the mast track because that area is quite prone to wear and tear. And that can make it very difficult to get the sail up and down if nothing else. Batten pockets as well is a key concern on the sails. And then when we take the mast down, uh, of course, we're washing everything before it gets stored as well. When we take the mast down, we'll have an inspection of the rigging. And, um, and also, just by lifting the mast, tipping it one way and the other way, you'll very quickly know if there's any water in the mast, which would mean you need to drain the mast. Because um, you don't want water in the mast, that's for sure. Um, the one thing that you definitely can do in your winter maintenance program is service your rudder system. Very good idea. Um, but unless it's mounted on the boat, you're not gonna be able to do a full rudder service, but you can certainly service the rudder stocks. That's a good idea. But um, back with the mast, when the mast's down, we can then have a look at the rigging as well and see if, it, if there's anything obviously wrong with the rigging. Unfortunately, with the rigging, if it is going to break, a lot of the time, um, there's no clear clues to say, yes, it's going to break. Um, it might have a bit of discoloration near to the, uh, the ferrules at the ends. But other than that, it's not going to give you any clues. Um, we replaced our rigging, I think it was either two or three years ago. I think it was the start of the season before last. Pretty sure it was. So this will be our, this year will be the third year for the rigging on our catamarans. So we'll get this year out of this rigging and then we'll replace it again for next year. Um, but um, for the amount our boats get used, I think every three, uh, we'll use it for three years and replace it on the fourth. But in the real world, you could probably get another year out of your rigging, especially if it's not in really harsh UV with perhaps salt water kind of wind blowing at it all day, every day, um, it's going to last a bit longer. Uh, check the trampoline, of course, for any um, repairs that need doing to the trampoline. Check all the ropes as they come off uh, for anything that needs to be replaced. But um, yeah, I think that's about the size of it. And then you could do an inspection of the hulls and the foils as well, the rudders and the dagger boards, um, where you're just checking for any damage that needs to be repaired there. But it's more of a checking than uh, a routine maintenance. And then, and then it's more for us of a replaced parts before we put the boats back together at the start of the season. So on the Hobie 16, of course, we'd put in a fresh mast pivot bearing, put in fresh bushes on the rudders. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be about it. And then change any ropes, like I said. So there we go. That's what we'd be looking at. Okay, Chris says, great answer. Thanks, Joe. 
Had a nasty one with my girlfriend on a broad reach, double trapeze. Turned downwind, just brought our weight forwards. Got exciting pretty quickly, I bet it did. Yeah, so, um, yeah, because um, if you are gonna turn downwind, make sure you're in a very secure position. And every time you turn your boat downwind, this could be like a, a golden rule. Um, every time you turn your boat downwind, always just ease the sails out a little bit. And that will, if you bear away, all right, if we come at it from the other end, if you want to pitch pole on purpose, this is how you do it. Get the boat going fast, or not even that fast. Get the boat going powered up. So with a full sail full of wind, and then turn downwind without letting the sails out, and then you'll pitch pole if there's enough wind. So by, by knowing that is how you pitch pole deliberately, that means if you turn downwind, you have to let the sails out or else you're gonna stick the nose in. And uh, there you go. I think it's worth everybody going out and doing some deliberate pitch poles, um, but don't, um, please be careful if you are gonna do that. Cause uh, yeah, it can get pretty exciting. Um, all right, next one, another one from Chris. Um, could you explain what to do with the telltales downwind and on the broad reach? Yeah, this is pretty straightforward actually. Um, with the telltales on the sails, um, we're gonna draw another picture because I have the facility to do so. I hope everybody's having a lovely time. Don't forget to hit the like button if uh, you like. Um, all right, so let's, uh, we'll just draw this, let's just draw this. So the telltales, we've obviously got one on the inside that we can see very clearly, and one on the outside represented by a dotted line. When I say the outside, this would be the leeward side of the sail, the one that we can see by looking kind of through the sail. If you've got a little window, that's very nice, but otherwise you can generally see the telltale through the sail. So if we're looking at having the sail set correctly by using the telltales, correctly on a beam reach or a broad reach would be so that the telltales on both sides of the sail, so if we draw in a, oh my goodness, that is definitely not to scale. Um, there's the sail, so there's the front of the telltales. The telltales are flying straight back. That is what we're looking for. Then, if, there's the telltale on the outside. So if the telltale on the outside is, is flying straight back, but the one on the inside is going up or maybe it's swirling around. What this inside telltale is, is it's kind of like an early warning system for your sail flapping. So if it goes up, if you then let the sail out further, the sail will start flapping. So if you wanna have it set perfectly, if that inside telltale's going up, pull the sail in slightly. This is the same for the main sail and the jib. Um, the telltale's working exactly the same way on both. So pull it in slightly if the inside one is lifting. Um, when it's really windy, you may have seen in the videos that um, I generally have the jib set further out than perfect. So the inside telltale would certainly be lifting or perhaps the jib would even be flapping slightly. This is to make sure that the jib is never in too tight, especially when it's really windy. Because if the jib is too tight, it's like putting the brakes on and the way that you're controlling the boat, especially in the strong wind, is by having the boat sailing as fast as possible. So having those brakes binding in the strong wind is gonna slow you down and you're more likely to have some sort of, uh, we're back to the pitch pole again. All right, the opposite will be if the inside one is flying straight back and the outside one 
maybe it's dropped or maybe it's swirling around, that means that the sail is in too tight. If the sail's in too tight, the windward telltale will still fly, but the outside one will stop flying. So that means you need to let the sail out. Pretty straightforward. So if it's the inside one, pull it in. If it's the outside one, let it out. And um, if you've got a crew who's really keen, get them playing the, the jib the whole time and you will get more boat speed uh, from your boat by having the sail in exactly the right position all of the time. There we are. Um, if neither of the telltales are flying, uh, perhaps you've just capsized, maybe they're wet and they've stuck to the sail. But if neither of the telltales are flying, generally speaking, it will be because the sail's too tight. So if in doubt, let the sail out. That almost rhymes. There we go. Okay, that was a very, very good explanation, I think you'll find. Okay, fantastic. All right, moving on with another preloaded question. These preloaded questions are great. So if, um, if you are watching this not live, um, then um, you can ask questions at any time, but just at the start of the question, um, yeah, thanks, Chris, nice one. Um, at the start of the question that you're asking by typing it somehow, say, put this in the Q&A, and what I'll do throughout the week is uh, collate a list of questions. Um, it will it will kind of look something like this. I've actually got my computer out. Look, it says Q&A questions, and... Uh, there we are. Um, so I have a list to work through. Very efficient at the Joyrider TV headquarters. I think you'll find. Okay, so we've got a question from E1K. Um, he says, how do you moor your boats? Um, just for those of you from not the English as your first language, uh, mooring is how, um, is like anchoring, but instead of an anchor, you have some sort of permanent fixture in the water that you attach the boat to. Um, I'm into this drawing pictures today. I hope everybody is uh, enjoying it as well. Um, so just to show what our actual mooring tackle uh, involves, what we have is we have a car tire Oh, this is going to be good. A car tire, which is filled with concrete. Okay, uh, the size of the car tire would um, vary depending on the size of the boat, but I would go for the biggest size car tire you possibly can. I have actually seen at the, um, the boatyard where I live at home, uh, well, in the UK, I don't really live there, to be honest, um, they use car wheels or lorry wheels because then with a lorry wheel, you get that, the rim like that. So you, this part is filled with um, concrete and the rim will actually bed in a bit better than the tires will. But we're on a, we've got a sandy bottom here uh, in Vasiliki. So the car tires over time, they gradually bed into the sand, making them very sturdy. What we would then have, the way that we're doing it nowadays is when we're putting the concrete in, we're putting a piece of like hose pipe running through the concrete, pipe, through the concrete. This is an exaggeration coming out the bottom. So then there's a, a space down the middle and then we can actually feed the rope down the middle of there, which means it, that we can replace the rope like every two years or something, we generally do that. Before we were uh, concreting chain into the tire, but then when that chain breaks, it will usually break at the concrete, then it means that that concrete tire then has to go in the bin. Um, because you, with the technology that we've got anyway, we couldn't drill a hole through the concrete um, it would take forever and be quite unpleasant. Uh, whereas with this tube running through, very good system. So then we have the rope 
coming through here. And um, I think about, for the sort of mooring that we're doing, about three times the depth of the water uh, seems to be about right. Um, and then we've, we have a buoy on the rope, which can float up and down. And then on the end, we have, or oh, the picture is, all right, it's a carabiner, uh, like a clip. And that is the tackle that we're using to moor the boats. And then what we'll do, let's go back over to our Hobie 16, which just conveniently happens to be here. Um, the, way, the best way to moor the boat is to have it so that the mooring is attached at the front. So what we do on all of our boats is we attach a small loop to the front of the bridle wires that's just tied on here. And then what we'll do when we get our carabiner clip on the mooring is that will clip onto the rope, but also onto the bridle wire. So the rope isn't taking the whole weight of the boat. The bridle wire is taking the weight, but the rope is just holding the mooring right in the middle and also stopping it from sliding down where if it hit the hull, could damage the hull. So it's a very handy way. A common um, mistake that people use when they're mooring or anchoring their boats is just to attach it straight to the dolphin striker where the boat isn't going to sit head to wind very well. It's going to be able to turn and do some 360s while it's anchored, which you don't want. Also, while the boat's on a mooring, we want to let off the downhaul, let off the jib sheets, um, and also we want to, uh, what we do is, because our main sheets are all on the snap shackles, we will actually um, release the main sheet completely, and then uh, we also put the rudders up. If you've got a boat with dagger boards, take the dagger boards out completely, and then I would always put the dagger boards under the toe strap just because there is a chance that they could get blown away. The reason we want to put the rudders up is because the worst possible thing for your rudder system is for the rudders to hit the bottom while the boat's going backwards because the rudders won't kick up if it hits the bottom backwards. And if the boat is on the mooring, there is always a slim chance that something is going to fail and your boat might drift off. And if it drifts off, you certainly don't want the rudders hitting the bottom. But a top tip with the mooring is don't take your main sheet off until the boat is definitely hooked on to the mooring. Because while your main sheet is still attached, you've got options. So if, um, let's say, you get your mooring slightly wrong and you don't hit it the first time. If you've already taken your main sheet off, then you haven't really got much of a choice, a chance to start sailing again. Whereas if your main sheet is still attached, uh, you can just jump back on the boat, start sailing, go round, come back, have another go. Don't think that taking the main sheet off is kind of like boat is going to stop. It's only if the boat is being held securely at the front that it is going to stop. There we go. Mooring. That is a very good explanation. Thanks for coming. Did anybody spot the cat there? Um, all right, we've got Jose in China. Um, wishing the whole team a happy Chinese New Year. The year of the bull. Ha <laughs> ha. Nice. Great to have you on board, Jose, and Happy New Year to you as well. Um, let's hope that it is an absolute banger, a really good one. Okay, this is a public service announcement. Jose really needs a jib for his Hobie getaway. If somebody is out there and has one for sale, then um, Jose needs it. Let's um, put the word out.
Let's get Jose that jib. And I think even if you are in the States, um, a jib for a getaway can be wrapped up pretty small, doesn't weigh very much. So the shipping, uh, if it doesn't have to be mega quick, can be realistically priced. So let's keep an eye out for a jib there for a getaway. Thanks, Jose, for tuning in. Um, all right, next pre-loaded question. And this is one that made me raise an eyebrow. Um, this is from Ewan, who says, how do you have more fun sailing solo? Hmm. I think um, if you're finding when you're going out sailing, you're not really enjoying it as much as you think you should, if it's not due to problems with the boat or um, maybe just some really horrible wind or something. Um, one thing that can make any sailing session perhaps more enjoyable is to go out with a purpose rather than just like, should we go out for a sail? Yeah, go on in. Um, whereas if you said, oh no, you're going solo. So you could say it to yourself. Uh, Shall we go out for a sail? Mm, yeah. um, then, but you could then think, all right, what, what are we going to do when we're out there? You could think, uh, Lee says go racing. Yes, um, that is a very good way to have more fun solo sailing. Racing, if you've never raced and there's a sailing club nearby to you or if there's an event coming to your area, have a go. It is really, really fun. And it means that you have to be more disciplined. You get a really good idea about how you're doing with your boat handling, what your boat speed's like compared to the other boats. And um, it's just a really nice way of getting out and doing something different with your boat. Um, we're gonna be coming on to, at some point, some more start line technique. So the start line is definitely the most intimidating part of any race. And um, once you've got your start line technique so that you can get off the start line cleanly um, and consistently without um, too much argy-bargy with the other boats, then racing is a really nice way to enjoy yourself. But um, what I was actually going to say was when you're about to go sailing, think, all right, shall we go somewhere specific? Like, even if you sail on a very circular lake, you could say, right, we're going to sail to that I know circles don't have corners, but uh, we're going to sail to that corner, then to that corner, and then to that corner. Lovely. Um, but have some sort of direction. Uh, that's why going on little adventures to other beaches, um, these camping trips um, that people go on, fantastic. Very nice indeed. Um, but having some purpose. Another really good thing you can do, this is going to be the last one with more fun uh, solo sailing, is go out and do some hull flying. Really, really fun. Richard says bring a GPS, work on improving your speed stick rating. Um, hello Arno as well from Canada. Nice to have you on board. Um, yeah, a lot of fun things that you can do solo. Um, if the wind's really light, try some crazy stuff. Like try doing some backwards sailing. Um, try sailing without the rudders. Um, try just all sorts of things, whatever you can imagine. Pretend you're 16 again, unless you actually are 16, in which case you don't have to pretend. Um, there we go. All right, so... All right, just before I proceed with the next real question that's coming in live, I uh, just got a question from Steve, who, um, following last week, when I said, if you are going to change your main sheet from one that comes from two parts on the boom to one that comes from one part on the boom, you are going to have to change where that boom hanger is. All right, let's, we'll just draw this because I don't, just to make sure that it's clear what I'm talking about. 
This is fairly specific for the Hobie 16. Um, in fact, this is extremely specific for the Hobie 16, because, all right, so if that's the boom, and you've got a uh, main sheet that comes off from two places, if that's your bottom block, then you're gonna have a pull like this, which means if you are gonna change your main sheet system to one which is just a triple block there and a triple block there, if you put that block at the back, the cleating angle is going to be all wrong. And if you put that block at the front, the cleating angle is going to be all wrong. So the best thing to do as a long-term solution is to remove these two brackets and fit one. It's pretty much exactly halfway in between. But um, I have done the measurement and the distance from the front of the boom, we've got a casting on the boom, you know, the fitting in the end of the boom. I'm not talking about the gooseneck fitting, which is like that, this part. So from there to where the hanger goes is 211 centimeters. There we go. All right, so on with the next question. And then I've just got one more preloaded question left, which is from Lucas in Brazil. So Lucas, if you're watching, I am getting on to it. Um, all right, I've got Arno who is in Canada. He's watched the traveler video, but he's still lost. What does letting your traveler out do, but letting the main sheet doesn't? What is it depowering? Don't you always want max? What is depowering? Don't you always want maximum power? No, depower, um, you get to a certain wind, firstly, the, the depowering question, you get to a certain wind speed, and um, if you keep your power at maximum, either the hull's gonna be in the air, you're gonna be capsized, maybe pitch pole, um, you're just gonna be fighting it the whole time. So it is necessary to, to depower. Once you're double trapezing on the boat and you're having to let the main sheet out all of the time, you definitely need to depower by other means than just the main sheet because it's not very efficient to be sailing with the main sheet really, really loose. You have very little control over the shape of the mainsail if the main sheet is loose. In, which, in fact, that is one of the fundamentals of why do we have a traveller. It's so that we can have more control over the shape of the mainsail. So, this is a big, big story of the traveller. In light winds or in winds where we are not having to depower at all, Upwind sailing, you have the traveller in the middle. This is very generally speaking. Traveller in the middle, um, that means all the way in, and that means that when you pull the main sheet in tight, the back of the mainsail will be pretty much on the centre line of the boat, which is going to mean we're going to be able to sail the closest to the wind. If we just start off with the story of upwind sailing, then as the wind increases, we'll move out onto the trapeze um, and we'll pull the downhaul on. Pulling the downhaul on flattens the sail. It opens up the leech of the sail at the top, which lets the sail kind of fan out a bit like a bird's wing, which allows the wind to spill off the top. Um, it also moves the center of effort, the deepest part of the sail, down and forwards, which drives the boat better upwind, having the centre of effort lower down means that the boat is effectively less top heavy. So it's not trying to just uh, heel over as much. And we're transferring that healing force into more boat speed by moving the centre of effort down and forwards by using the downhaul. If having done all that, we're still having to sheet out the mainsail all the time or sail the boat so close to the wind that we're going really, really, really slowly, then 
we want to let the traveler out a bit. So we've still got that tension in the back of the mainsail, um, in the back of the mainsail, which is gonna help us to point up wind, but we've changed the angle of attack of the, main of the mainsail, so we're not gonna have all of that power. If you've got a jib traveler as well, it's important that the jib traveler is always out at least as much as the main traveler percentage wise, or if not more, so that like we said earlier, the jib is never in tighter than the main. So that is stage one for the traveler, using it to depower on an upwind point of sail. Very important, very handy. Um, okay, so we can use exactly the same on a beam reach. So the beam reach is sailing with the true wind coming from directly square to the boat. So that is if we sailed past a flag, that would be pointing directly at the boat. Uh, that is what we're calling a beam reach. On a beam reach, we can do exactly the same thing, um, the same steps as well with the downhaul and everything. And then if we're double, um, but on a beam reach, we'd want to already set the traveler about halfway out because what we're doing is we're using on points of sail, we're using the traveler for the point of sail and then the main sheet for fine tuning and let's say gust response. So if you get a gust, perhaps ease the main sheet out. If a gust goes, pull the main sheet back in. It's all about playing the main sheet. We've said that before. Um, and then the traveler is for the angle of attack, the general position. So on a beam reach, we wanna set it approximately halfway out to start with. But then if we have too much power and we're needing to sheet out all of the time, you have much better control if you let the traveler out more and sail with the main sheet a bit tighter, but still playing the main sheet in the gusts. Are we good so far? I think so. And then continuing on to the broad reach, downwind sailing, we wanna have the traveler almost all of the way out. Um, and, uh, and then we'll play the main sheet from that position. Um, of course, with the Traveller almost all the way out, we're not going to put it out more if the wind gets any stronger. We're then going to have to let the main sheet out a bit more on the broad reach. This is if we're sailing with two sails without a spinnaker. So we're using the Traveller for point of sail and for extra depowering on the upwind and on the reaching course. We could, of course, if we had a really, 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 really long main sheet rope. We could keep the traveler in the middle and never move it and just have loads and loads of main sheet out. But in the gusts, because we've got a six to one, maybe an eight to one on the main sheet, in the gusts, you'd have to play with so much rope, it would be unmanageable. And the amount of rope that you'd need if you imagine having the sail out on your boat all the way with the rope going six times from out there to the middle, it's a lot of rope. Um, so when you've pulled it all in, that would be a hell of a lot of rope, which is why we have the traveller. You could look at it in that the traveller is like the gears. If it, we're using a car analogy. Traveller is like the gears and the main sheet is like your throttle. Hi James, great to have you with us. Um, I hope that is a worthwhile explanation on uh, the traveler. Um, I hope so. Um, all right, so we've been going for quite some time now. Um, I'll just say hi to everyone who's just tuned in, but no more questions, please. Um, so I hope that's all right, Arno. Hope that helps to clear that up a bit. Steve says, I find a short mooring rope works better from preventing the boat from bouncing around in the wind. Yeah. Yeah, if your mooring rope is longer, then that does give the boat more ability to kind of wander a bit. So, um, but you don't want to have it so that the mooring rope 
like the direction that the rope is pulling, that's a good indication. So if the rope, if this pen is a rope, if the rope is going straight down, that's not very good. But what you want, ideally, I'd say, is the rope coming back at about 45 degrees from the bridle wires where you've got it anchored straight through to your ground weight, that would do it. Or a bit more if it's really windy. The reason we go quite long is because we get so much wind here, the more rope you have out, the less it's gonna try to drag the weight. There we go. Man, Un Man United Herbert. Hello from Manchester, great to have you on board. Hope that United is doing well this season. I don't follow football, um, but um, all the best for Man U. Um, all right, last preloaded question, then I'm gonna clock off. This is from Lucas in Brazil, he's got a 16, and he's taking in a small amount of water in his Hobie 16, and he says, where is my 16? Leaking. <whistles> Juicy. All right, the most easiest place to check, and if it is the source of the leak, it's the easiest one to fix as well, is check on your bungs. Brazil's a hot country. What could happen is if you've got your bungs out, these rubber seals are essential. If your rubber seal is perished, like if it's cracked, if it's not in good condition, get that bad boy replaced. Make sure when you put your bungs in, there's no sand or anything on the bung because it sounds crazy, but the boat can leak a fair... Oh, there's a little bit there. A uh, fair bit just from the bung. So just pay attention to your bungs. That is the easiest fix. After that, I'd say pretty much everywhere else. Um, a, one thing that... Um, that we've done here at Wildwind in the past is we've actually made a custom bung fitting that, um, or you, you could even, if you've got a pump, here we go. This is really throwing it out there. This is gonna sound crazy. But if you get a pump like a kite pump, maybe a foot pump for a inflatable boat, um, maybe uh, a bicycle pump, but with a custom made fitting on the end, have it so that the fitting on the end is kind of bunghole size, cover the boat in soapy water, and then pump, making sure you've got a good seal there, pump the hull up, and then see where the bubbles are coming out. That is gonna tell you where the boat is leaking. Perhaps if you have two people doing it, one person could be on pumping, and one person could be on soaping and looking, that would be a very good way of finding out where your leak is. Um, what we've done, rather than having a hose that fits in there, is we've actually taken an old bung, drilled a hole down the middle, so that you can plug the pump into the middle of the bung, so you get a good tight seal there, and then you can find out where the leak is. But for a, a boat which isn't off the production line, isn't brand new, um, I'd say about, if you've got like about a cup of water in the hull after a reasonable length session, then you're doing all right. Okay, I saw James said, isn't there a vent inside the pylon? Yeah, there is. Just um, inside here, there is a little ventilation piece. But in our experience, you'll still get the bubbles coming out. In fact, uh, this cat, is called bubbles. Isn't that funny? Um, yeah, you'll still get the bubbles coming out um, of the hull where it's leaking. So it's still a worthwhile technique. There we go. Oh, hi, William. Glad you could make it. All right, so I hope that is good for you, Lucas, and you can find your leak. Or if it's only a little bit of water, everybody's boat leaks a bit. I think the boats that don't leak at all are definitely in the minority. So you're not alone with a leaky boat. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna 
call it a day there. I think, hi William and hi Miguel. Um, oh, uh, Arno says, can't wait for non minus 33, 35, minus 35. Um, I think tip of the hat to everybody in Canada uh, for just definitely having the coldest weather of everyone. All right, and last, last one, last question really. Uh, Miguel says, I get a trailer for my Hobie Cat 16. How it have to be the box for the trailer? Yeah, uh, if you're putting a box on your trailer, the main consideration is you want it to be big enough to put the mainsail in with the boom. The boom is the longest piece. So measure the whole length of the boom. I only measured up to the hanger and I know that's 211. So the whole boom would be about two and a half meters. So your box needs to be two and a half meters long and big enough to put the sails in, the rudders, all those kind of things. Um, and uh, then you're on to a winner. Um, we'll just take one look at the box we've got on this trailer here. It's not an enormous box, but it's big enough to get everything in. And that's all you need. Um, of course, if you're going to go away for some trips with your boat, nice to have a bit more space so you can put more stuff in. Um, if I was going to design a trailer, I'd want to put the biggest box I could under the boat so you could take as much stuff as possible. But um, it's all personal preference. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. It's been a great pleasure. Once again, don't forget to hit the like button. Um, head over to totaljoyrider.com. Check out the new stuff that is in there. And this is now going to be either shipping from mainland Europe or from the States, depending on where you are. So if you are in the US, the shipping times will be much less. And also, you shouldn't get fingered quite so much with um, tax as perhaps previously when it was coming from the UK. So thanks very much. Um, oh, might get a new downhaul meter for the new season. Great choice. Um, yeah, all right, wicked. See you next week with some more. Um, otherwise, see you on Sunday with Show Us Your Cat. Uh, keep the boats, keep the pictures coming in for Show Us Your Cat, by the way. Um, even if you have been featured before, if you're sailing in a new place, if you've got new sails or if there's something um if you've just got some really good footage of your boat uh then let's have it um because it's you guys who are keeping show us your cat going because you keep showing us your cat and without showing us your cat there would be no show us your cat so there we are let's keep it going all right see you next week and This is the prodding the screen of try to turn it off. All right.